right, thank you for that. Uh, if you got your Bibles with you this morning, we're in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Now, as I look around the room, I, I, I've met a lot of y'all's kids, and so this is not going to come as a shock to some of you. Now, right now, some of you parents are nervous. You're like, what is the preacher fixing to say? Isn't that the beauty of this moment? I can have you on pins and needles, and you're going, he's fixing to spill family secrets on me. No, I wouldn't do that to you. I really wouldn't. But as I look around the room, I've met a lot of your kids, and a lot of you, I look around, and you've got little mini-me's. They look like you, they act like you, they talk like you, and you go, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> you take that however you want. But no, over the last few weeks, we've talked about my dad and uh, some things that I, I've learned from my dad. And here's what uh, my mom would tell you. Here's what my wife would tell you. I am a lot like my dad. In fact, we get home for the holidays, and uh, my mom and my wife and my sister-in-law get to talking about me and my brother. And they go, the older you get, the more like him you get. And I just look at them and go, well, you are welcome. I don't know if that's how they meant that, but, you know, I, I mean, seriously. And it, it reminds me of this one time we, mom and dad had come down to visit, and the Razorbacks were in basketball season, and me and dad were in there watching the Razorback game. And mom said, I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to go take a nap. Well, the nap did not go very well because, well, let's just be honest, the Razorback game was not going very well, so the nap wasn't going to go very well. But mom comes back out, and she goes, do you two realize that y'all say the exact same thing at the exact same time through the whole game. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I get, I learn from the best. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you here. But she said, you are just alike. And so you get to thinking about that. Oh, okay, well, how am I just like dad? Well, if you ever see my dad, you're going to see this pose right here. If you ever see me standing around in a group of people, you see us sitting side by side. Guess what? We're both going to be sitting there. We're going to have that leg crossed over the exact same way. We walk in a room the way that we talk to people, the exact same way to the point where y'all ever had that? You say something and somebody swears that you were your parent talking? Yeah. And people go, I would have swore that was Gary. I'm like, no, nope, it's just David. Sorry to disappoint you. But we do so many things the exact same same way. Now here's the thing. I never set out to be like my dad. There was never a point in time where I said, you know what? I want to model everything I do after that man. I want to look like him, sound like him, talk like him. Everything I do, I want to be just like dad. There was never a conscious moment where that happened for me. It just happened because the more that I was around him, the more I became like him. Now, over the last few weeks, we've talked about a lot of the lessons that I've gleaned from my dad over the years. We started these life lessons from dad by talking about a great faith. And my dad has taught me that there is nothing ever that is too big for God, too outside the realms of God's possibility. And so there's a great faith that comes in knowing that whether I understand it or can see how it's going to happen, God can and will make a way. Dad taught me about godly leadership, how there's a difference between just being a leader and a godly leader and pursuing God's interest in his kingdom at all costs and leading others to do the same. Last week we talked about how my dad taught me about failure and his favorite Bible character being King David and dad's famous statement to me. The reason David was his favorite Bible character was not because he was king or a mighty warrior or whatever, but because David knew how to deal with his sin. And Dad taught me how important that was in my own life, and I'm so glad that he did because I'm going to tell you, that's a lesson I use every single day. But as we get ready to close this series out, there's one more lesson that I, I, I'm grateful for. You know, th there's a lot of things that Dad has taught me, and most of those he's taught me not by some great lecture, which is kind of ironic since Dad spent 30-something years in the classroom teaching, but Dad didn't just give me these great lectures and, you know, bullet points of what all I need to learn. Dad modeled it before me. And so as I watched Dad, I, he, he modeled what it meant to be a man. He modeled what it meant to be a good dad. He modeled how to connect and teach with other people. But here's the thing, beyond everything else that my dad has modeled and taught me through the years, 
He's taught me. He modeled for me what it looked like to follow Jesus. That's what his most important lesson is. And as we look at our passage today, we're going to see a dad who is leading by example and modeling the correct attitudes and behaviors for his son. Now, this is going to be a familiar passage. Uh, you, you, you turn to Luke 15 and you, you start reading those bold headings above the passage and you probably figured out where we're going right now. We're going to read the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son. But I'm going to tell you in a minute, I really believe we would do just as well to flip the script and look at the father instead of the son. And so let's just read the passage and then we'll, we'll talk some more about this. But in Luke 15, we're going to pick up in verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Time out. Lest we miss out on something right here at the very beginning. Can you almost feel the disrespect? First off, Jesus makes a point to tell us he has how many sons? Two. And which one asked for his money? The baby. Now, if you're the baby in the family, I apologize. Not all of us can be perfect. Uh, that's right, I'm the oldest. If you're the baby in the family, you got it way better than they ever would have. Because as the baby in the family, guess what? You got the leftovers. That oldest son... He was going to get the lion's share. He was going to get the abundance of the estate. But the younger son says, I don't care about birth order. I don't care who's got what rights. I'm going to dad. And so it wasn't just that, but when he went to dad and he's asking for his inheritance, any of y'all ever received an inheritance? I'm not asking if it was a fortune, but you received anything at all. Uh, you know, it may be a book or a watch or whatever. When does that usually take place? After somebody has passed, you can almost feel the disrespect here as this bratty little son comes to dad and says, Hey dad, since you're not kicking the bucket anytime soon, can you just go ahead and give me my money now? You can almost just feel the disrespect here. But that was the request. He wanted his stuff now. And what was the dad's response? So he divided his property between them. Now I'll pick back up in verse 13. It says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now again, time out. We've talked about being low. You know, so low that, you know, you, you just don't think things can get any worse. The pit of the pits. That's where this young man found himself. It wasn't just that he had blown through a fortune. It wasn't just that all the friends that were around him when things were going good have now deserted him. He says he's, he's broke. And I'm like, oh, I'm relating to this story more and more all the time. But he's broke by his own choices. Okay, so I still relate to this story more and more all the time. But notice what he did in his brokenness. Where did he turn? He said, you know what? There ain't no way I'm admitting that I was wrong. There is no way I'm going to go ask some of these friends for help. There is no way I'm doing that. And so instead, you know what? I passed that pig farm a while back. I'm going to go ask for a job. And we go, oh, how admirable of him. He's willing to go to work. He's willing to take menial jobs just to make ends meet. Until you realize this is a good Jewish boy who pigs are, mm -mm, no, no, don't do that. And what he was saying was, I'm still willing to turn my back on everything I've ever been taught to go make ends meet instead of dealing with my own failure. So it says he goes, and it's not just enough that he, he gets hired on to take care of the pigs. Look what happens next. Uh, verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, 
but no one gave him anything. <laughs> when I was a, a seminary student in Fort Worth, my mom came to visit one weekend, and uh, I'd left a stack of bills laying on on the, the kitchen bar there, kind of in between the, the little pass-through. And my mom sees the electric bill. Now, y'all, my electric bill was $15.37. My mom goes, son, how do you have a $15.37 electric bill? I said, easy. You don't turn anything on. She said, well, why don't you turn anything on? I said, because I don't have any money in the bank. And my mom's, I mean, she, she was almost incredulous at that point. She goes, why didn't you call? Because I wasn't about to tell them that I was struggling, that I couldn't make it. And so you just did what needed to be done. That's where this young man finds himself. Instead of going, you know what, I, I messed up. He just says, I'll do whatever I got to do. And he gets so hungry that he's willing to eat the pig's food. But he can't even get that. And it's then when he hits rock bottom that the lesson hits. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. Now I want you to notice, what did it take for him to get to that realization? Rock bottom. That's not an easy place, and we're going to talk some more about that here in a minute. But when he hit rock bottom, the realization hit him. What in the world am I doing? And he says, you know what, even if I'm not worthy to be a son... I've never seen one of my dad's servants go without food. I've never seen one of my dad's servants go without clothing or shelter. What am I doing? Go home. Admit you were wrong. And so in my mind, he's, he's walking down this road, and every step of the way he's rehearsing this speech to dad. I'm no longer worthy to be your servant. I've sinned against God and against you. Well, you just hire me back as a servant. And over and over again, he's rehearsing this speech. Now then, let's flip the script to the father. Verse 20 says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? It's a wonderful story. We like that. And Jesus used stories like this often. Jesus talked in parables a lot. And here's the thing, we, we kind of need to ask, why did Jesus teach in parables? Why do we see them so often in Scripture? That's easy for us to go, oh, well, Jesus taught in parables to teach a certain point. And he did to an extent. I mean, there's a point to be made in this story. But he also taught in parables to stir up a spiritual hunger in those that he's talking to. He wanted them to ask questions. He wanted them to want more. Well, this parable, this story, was meant to remind us of, the import, of our importance to God and to give us a glimpse of God's character. So I told you earlier, we know this story as the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. But I think we would be just as well to call it the parable of the perfect father. The parable of the perfect, the model father. See, Jesus went out of his way to paint two pictures in this story. First half, he paints the picture of the wayward son. Which, by the way, if you hadn't connected the dots yet, that's each and every one of us. Uh, stubborn and rebellious and just at all costs, we're going to do it our way and we're going to see what happens and let the cards fall where they will. Jesus paints a very vivid picture of that wayward son. But then he also paints a picture of the model father who is God. And as we look at these two, we see this perfect reflection. 
We see how God treats us, how the perfect father treats the wayward son, how God treats us. But we also see that in that, how we ought to treat other people. And so whether you are a parent today, whether you just have some, uh, a friend or a coworker or whatever, a lot of these characteristics we need to apply in our relationships with other people. So what are these characteristics that we see here? When we look at the model dad, the perfect father in this parable, what characteristics does he show? So there's four of them we're going to look at today. The first one that we're going to look at is this. That perfect father modeled freedom. He modeled freedom. Y'all ever had uh, uh, your child or a friend or somebody come to you and they have this idea that they're going to try and make work, they're going to do something, and in the back of your mind, the whole time you're going, that's a bad idea. This is not going to turn out well. And you, you really, you just, you just want to shake them, don't you? Because you know where it's likely to end up. You know how you know where it's likely to end up? Because more times than not, we've been there. We made that same stupid decision, that same stupid mistake, and you're like, oh, I know where this road leads. Let me just tell you up front. And so we can, we should, we ought to speak into them and try and give godly wisdom and part that in their lives. But at the end of the day, whose choice is it? Not ours. It's not ours to make. As much as we would love to make that decision for them, we can't. You can give wise counsel all day long, and you should give wise counsel. But it's their choice to make. See, we have to come to a point, just like the Father did, where we realize that freedom is part of the learning process. I want you to put yourself in the Father's shoes. He's going about his regular, ordinary routine. Maybe he's in his home office or something, and there's a knock on the door and it's that younger son not an unusual occurrence come on in son what can I do for you but nothing prepared him for what was fixing to come out of his mouth dad I want my inheritance now now as a parent he immediately knew where all this was going to head he immediately knew what this young kid was going to do with the money that he was about to give and he's I want to try and talk him out of it. But at the end of the day, what did he do? He gave him the freedom to go learn. He gave him the freedom to go and make mistakes. Even though the father knew where this road was likely going to end up, even though the father knew what was probably going to happen, he gave him the inheritance anyway. It reminds me of uh, a couple years ago, Natalie had gotten some birthday money. And it was right before we were going to go on vacation. And, you know, we were going to tell her, you know, you're going to be able to spend stuff. You're going to be able to buy something on vacation. But we were going to Walmart. And Natalie said, well, can, can I take some of my money to Walmart? Parent radar goes off. Lights are flashing and buzzing in my head. And I'm going, that's a really bad idea. Because I know how you and Walmart money go. If it's in your pocket, it's going to burn a hole in it. And you're not going to leave with the same money that you walked in with. And so I'm trying to talk her out of it. No, baby, we're, we're fixing to go on vacation. You'll, you'll want to spend it there. You'll wish you had it there. But she wasn't having it. Now, as a dad, I had a choice to make. I could have said, no, go put it back in your bank. You can take it on vacation. Or... I can let my daughter learn a life lesson. So I said, okay. You can take it to Walmart. Well, sure enough, my worst fears are confirmed. I mean, we hadn't even made it through the front doors. Can we go to the toys? Baby, we got grocery shopping to do. But can we go to the toys? Fine. We'll go to the toys. And up and down every toy aisle we go. And she's looking at every little knickknack she can get her hands on. And she ended up, I don't even remember what she bought. But she blew that money. She was so happy with herself, so proud of herself. Um, by the time we actually left to go on vacation, she had not played with the toy in a few days. We get on vacation and she wanted something. And I said, Pumpkin, remember that money? 
and I told you to save from Walmart. But I wanted that then. I understand that. But that was money that you don't have now. And just like I was with Natalie, that the father in this parable, as he saw his son and he heard the, the, the request for his inheritance early, he knew exactly where this was headed. He could see the heartache that was around the corner. He knew what was going to happen. But he was smart enough and wise enough to know that freedom is part of the learning process. Giving him the freedom to go out and make his own mistakes. Giving him the freedom to make his own decisions so that he can learn from his own experience. Now, I don't care if you're a parent or what. That can be a pretty difficult position, can it? You see somebody that you know and love and they're going down a road that you know is going to bring pain and heartache and disappointment. And you try your best to speak godly counsel and wisdom into them, but they're having none of it. That's a hard position to be in. Because we want so badly, like I said, just to shake them and say, do you hear me? And go, no, you just go sit in your room and I'll make this decision for you. But that's not the way it works. They've got to make it for themselves and here's why. Because if you always jump in, you make the decision for them. They may learn, uh, you don't do this because I said so. Parents, you ever use that line? I swore I never would. And yeah, it's one of my favorites. If you don't ever give them the freedom to learn from their own experiences, they may get the because I said so. But they're not ever going to be convinced that it's right because they know so. So there's going to come a point in time, whether you're a parent, a friend, a co-worker, whatever, you're not going to be around. And they're going to have to be able to make a decision for themselves. And do you really want them to have to answer them and go, well, because mom said so, because dad said so, because my friend said so, because my co-worker said so. Or do you want them to go, no, this is what I found to be true. Freedom allows the learning process to take place. And that's what the father did here. He gave the son freedom to go out and learn and experience and make his own mistakes so they can learn from his own bad decisions. The father also showed patience. You're like, oh, here we go. Y'all have heard the preacher talk. You know how high up on the list patience is. You know how, how high I rank in that. Uh-uh. If you've ridden with me, you know patience is not one of my better virtues. I am not above a holy honk. If you're sitting at a light and uh, you're gawking at your phone or just looking around and that light's green, look, I'll give you a second. But at two, honk, honk, we got to get moving. Patience is not one of my virtues. But I want you to notice the patience that the dad shows in this story. He faithfully watched for his son. See, and I, I don't know how this really looked, but in my mind's eye, they had this big porch, with, this big house with a wraparound porch and the rocking chairs on the front porch, and Dad is sitting out there on the rocking chair every day, looking down the road, faithfully watching for his son. Now, here's the thing. You think the dad knew what his son had gotten into? I, I think surely reports had trickled back in. You know, I mean, we, we live in fairly small town, rural Arkansas. How long does it take for word to get around town here? Not very long. Can you just imagine, as word starts trickling in of how, what this guy's youngest son had been a part of, and how he was wasting his money, and then how he blew it all, and how he's now living with pigs, hoping to eat what they eat. Word comes trickling in, and his worst fears, oh yeah, they're confirmed. This is exactly what I was afraid would happen. He's going to blow through it all. Nobody's going to be there for him. He's disengaged from his support team. He's, he has no family around. This is the absolute worst that I could have imagined. Was the father heartbroken? Oh, absolutely. Like any of us would be. Whether it's a child or a friend or whatever, he's heartbroken. But here's what I want you to notice. Even though the dad has the financial means and the manpower to send somebody to, to go grab that boy by the ear and drag him back home, what does he do? He waits. He patiently waits and watches. He waits and watches. Because he knew 
They didn't need to leave the son there to learn what the son needed to learn. The dad realized that he can't rush into the rescue and in the process hijack the learning process, hijack that teaching moment. And parents, I'm going to tell you, that is so incredibly difficult to see your kid fail and not run in, swoop them up and go, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll make it all right, and then insulate them from that altogether. That's difficult. I admire the father in this story for going, I know what's going on. I've heard the reports. I know where my boy's at. I know what he has done. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to watch. Because he needs to learn a lesson that I can't teach him. See, none of us like to see loved ones suffer. But here's the question we've got to ask. Do we love them enough? To let God use hard times and bad decisions to teach them difficult life lessons. See, in our mind, we justify running in and hijacking the learning process because, well, we just love them so much that I, I just I, I can't let them be in pain. Do you love them enough to let God get the lesson through by whatever means necessary? You say, but I feel so helpless. Yeah comes with the territory what do I do then if I don't rush in and pick them up and swoop them up and try and make everything okay what do I do you patiently wait like the father and occupy yourself like this pray pray for their safety or do you know where they're at do you know what they're doing God I just pray that you would watch over them and take care of them I know I can't but God, nothing is out of bounds for you. Pray for their safety. Pray for their heart. That they would guard their heart, not toss the baby out with the bathwater, everything they've ever learned. That somewhere in there, God would guard their heart and those seeds of what they learned growing up would remain. Which is exactly what Scripture teaches us, isn't it? If you instill it in them, oh, they may get good at ignoring it, but it's still there. Pray that God would guard their hearts. Pray for their willingness to learn. Let's just say it like it is. Pray for some humility. God, I pray that you'd give them uh, a humility to be able to acknowledge their situation, to see how far they have fallen. God, I pray that you'd give them a heart that is willing to accept what it is you're trying to teach. Then you also pray for the humility to come home. That pride wouldn't be what keeps them from saying, I made a mistake. Pride wouldn't be what keeps them from coming back and being restored into the relationship that you so desperately want. It's hard to be patient. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you otherwise. But be patient. Wait and watch like the father in the story did. I have to believe that the father in the story daily was praying for this boy, wanting the best for this boy. We can do the same. As we wait patiently, as we watch patiently, pray. So the father, he gave freedom. The father showed patience. What else? The father loved abundantly. I love as we get to the middle of this passage. The son has decided that the pig farm is not the place for him to be. He's decided that, you know what? I have been an absolute, utter fool. I'm going home. He says, I may not be able to be a son, but at least I can be a servant. At least I can have a food and I can have a house and clothes I'm going home. I love what we see out of this because it says this, the dad is waiting and watching. And it says, while the son was still what? A long way off. The father sees him. And what's the father's response? He doesn't sit back and cross his arms and go, well, it's about time. I knew that boy would come crawling back eventually. 
No, what's his response? He says, that old man hops up and as undignified as it would have been, took off running to meet his son. He took off running to meet the wayward child, the one who'd squandered his inheritance, the one who'd made a mockery of his family name. The father took off running to meet him. And we're left to ask, why in the world would the father do that? Why in the world would he take off running like that to go meet this boy? Quite simply, the father ran to meet his son out of a deep, deep love. You've heard it said, love's a powerful thing. Love can change you on a fundamental level. This father understood love, and he showed love abundantly. According to Scripture, love keeps no record of what? Love keeps no record of wrongs. You go to 1 Corinthians 13, and this is one of the reasons why people like this as a, a, a wedding verse, because it's kind of a, a contract. Hey, you're, you're, you're promising that you will love, honor, and cherish one another forever and ever. So this is what that looks like. Boom, 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 boom. One of the things in that list is love keeps no record of wrongs. I want you to imagine this father, if this hadn't been the definition of love that he followed, this meeting goes a little differently. As he has run to meet the son. Hang on, boy. This is page one. I left the other ones back at the house. We'll get to it later. You did this and this and this. And, nope. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And this father modeled that before his son. But I love what else we see here. Love moved first. Love didn't wait for the son to come up and be apologetic and go, okay, well, I love you because you said you're sorry. Nope. Love moved the father first. He said, I'm going to make the first move. Which I think speaks volumes about this last thing here. Love leads to forgiveness. Love leads to forgiveness. Now, ask yourself, when did the dad forgive the son? Was it when he saw him in the distance? He goes, oh, there's the one I've been longing for. Okay, I forgive him. Nope. Dad never sits out there on that porch and looks down the road waiting and watching patiently day after day after day if he hasn't already forgiven his boy. Dad forgave the son long before he came home simply because of his great love for him. Because dad loved him, because dad forgave him out of that love, when he meets him, it goes completely off script. It's not the way that you or I would have done it. Dad doesn't wait for him to get to the house so that they can have their words. Dad doesn't, when he runs out of the tomb, start to interrogate him about all the things he's done and wants all the details and so he can shame him about them. He doesn't scold the son over all the bad decisions and mistakes that he's made. Instead, what does the dad do? He just wraps his arms around him and loves him. Welcome home, son. He just loves him. And what we see in that moment this pure, 100% love flowing from a heart that has long ago forgiven his wayward child. We start talking about this kind of love, and that's difficult for us, isn't it? The preacher, they've hurt me so badly. I understand that. And I promise you, this father understood that. The son had shamed him. The son had made a mockery out of him, disgraced him. This father knew hurt. This father knew pain. But he said, I don't care. That's my boy. And I love him. And I forgive him even before he has thought to ask for it. I love him before it even entered his mind that maybe he even did anything wrong. I forgive him. Love leads us to forgiveness. There's one more thing here, and the Father, he also shows us grace. Grace. Amazing grace. There came a point where the son is there wallowing with the pigs. 
where it hit him just how low he had gone, how far he had fallen. And remember what was it he said? You know what? How many of my father's hired men, his hired servants, have food to eat, clothes to wear, a place to stay? I'm not worthy of being a son, but I'll go back and I'll ask to be a servant. The son had become painfully aware of his mistakes. And in his mind, here's the conclusion he reached, that he was no longer worthy to be considered an heir. He was no longer worthy to be considered a son. Because of the shame that his honor had brought upon himself and his entire family, that ship had sailed. He could no longer hold that role. So he prepares this elaborate speech, asking the dad just to hire him as one of his servants. And then that moment happens. Dad runs out and they embrace. And any of y'all see that old movie, Chariots of Fire? That beat scene where it's... And the music starts playing in the background. You're like, yes, they're going to hug. That's what happens. They have this big embrace. And dad just tells him, welcome home. And the son just goes into the speech. I'm like, son, read the room. Dad loves you. Dad's forgiven you. He has run out here to meet you. Read the room, son. But he doesn't. He just goes into the speech. Dad, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but if you would just hire me as one of your hired servants. And meanwhile, the dad is turning around looking for servants. Bring a robe, sandals, a ring. Get a party started. See, in the son's mind, he did not deserve to be a son any longer. He did not deserve to be an heir any longer. And here's the kicker. He didn't. He didn't deserve it. It was no longer in his birthright. There was nothing in him that said, you deserve to be an heir. But the dad was still having none of it. The dad in that moment chose to show him abundant, amazing grace instead. The son was restored to his position in the family. He was the son of the master, an heir to the father. Here's what I want you to understand. Whereas love leads to forgiveness. Grace? Grace opens the door to restoration. This young man never thought in his wildest dreams that he'd get to be a son again. This young man never thought in his wildest dreams that he would be known as an heir again. But dad said, no, I'm extending you grace not because you deserve it. Not because I'm just sweeping everything you've done under the rug and acting like it didn't happen. I'm choosing to restore you regardless. And folks, that is a beautiful picture of grace. You and I don't deserve grace any more than the Son did. But God chooses to lavish it upon us. Chooses to give it to us freely. So as we've talked about these characteristics of the Father, these are all things exactly that we've experienced at the hands of God. We've all been that wayward child who rebelled against Him. We've all been the one who acted foolishly and stubbornly and went in and said, give me what I want and give it to me now. And we decided that our way is better than God's ways, and we went out and we tried to live that out. We brought shame and dishonor upon Him because of our rebelliousness. We went out and done things in our way, in our time, in our name. And all the while, claiming to be one of his. And we've brought shame on him because of it. But, he's patiently waited. He's patiently waited and watched as we've experienced life's hard lessons. You think back some of the best lessons, the hardest lessons you've ever learned. Because in the pit of despair, you realize maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you had to swallow some foolish pride. But you learned it because of that hard situation. We also know that God's loved us enough to forgive us. Long before I was willing to seek it out. 
Even when I was in the middle of my rebellion, God says, I love you, son. I forgive you. Just come home. We can relate. And then as we see here at the very end, we see that God has graciously restored all of us to a relationship with himself. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I am restored. It doesn't matter how many times I'm that stubborn, wayward child. It doesn't matter how many times I bring shame and dishonor upon him by the way I do things or the way I say things. He says, I'm going to show you grace because of what my son did on that cross. So we've experienced all of these things at God's hands. And I've told you, my dad's not perfect, but I think he's pretty close. My dad has taught me a lot in my life. But he, what he has done his best to do is to model this kind of righteousness before me every day of his life. He's tried to model what it looks like to give me freedom and practice patience and to love me and to show me grace when grace is warranted and needed. He's tried to model this for me every single day. And he's taught me that if I'm going to be like Jesus, if I'm going to follow Jesus like he has tried to follow Jesus, then I need to learn to see myself from both sides of this parable. I need to learn to see myself as the wayward son. And as I see myself as the wayward son, I'm reminded that I'm never so far gone that I can't find my way back home. That my heavenly father is there waiting and watching, looking for me. He has never once given up on me. And he never will. So as I see myself from the son's perspective, I realize what I've got to run home to. But as I see myself from the father's perspective, I'm challenged how I deal with other people. If that's how the father dealt with the son there, then why should I not deal with other people the same way? Whether it be my daughter or my wife, a friend, a church member, whoever it may be, I ought to relate to them. I ought to treat them the same way that we see the father treating people in this parable. Folks, as we close this down, I just want to ask you a question. What model are you following? My dad modeled what it looked like to follow Jesus. And I'm so grateful that he did because there's a lot of things that if he just put it in a, a book or whatever, I would have skimmed over it. I would have missed a whole lot. But I got to see him live it out. What model are you following? Are you going to try and be like Jesus? Or are you going to try and do it your own way and follow something else? My prayer is that as we look at the, the parable of the perfect father, we seek to follow that model in all that we do. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and Lord, I just, uh, Lord, I thank you for the lessons that my dad has taught me over the years. Lord, the things that I've seen uh, lived out in him, Lord, even... Uh, the good times, the bad, it doesn't matter. Lord, I thank you for the model that he's been. I've got to thank you even more for the model that you give us. God, the parable of the perfect father, the model of a perfect father. Lord, of how we relate to not just our children, but everybody that we meet. We're going to pray that as we realize how much we're like the wayward son. That, God, you'd push us to be more like the perfect dad. That, Lord, those characteristics that he modeled will be what we allow you to, to mold and shape us into. God, as we go into this time of response, I, I don't know what you're doing in hearts, Lord. I don't know what you're saying. But, God, I pray that we can't ignore you. 
for whatever it is that needs to be done. Lord, I pray that today is the day and right now is the time that, God, we would uh, not leave here not doing the business that we need to with you. So, God, just speak to us now as we go into this time of response. Lord, just have your will and your way in each and every one of us. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.